<laughs> Thank you. All right, we are we are live on Facebook now. That's so exciting. Hello and welcome everybody. Today we're going to be talking about the cancer chapter in our new textbook, Ketogenics, the Science of Therapeutic Carbohydrate Restriction in Human Health. And we have some of the authors from this chapter, not the, all the authors, but we have some of the esteemed authors from this chapter here. We have Martha who writes about um, about keto and sorry about fasting and chemo we have nashu who writes about fasting and cancer in general we have prof who writes about cancer as a modern disease and that isn't all i just want to let you know that in the chapter also we deal with uh we have uh seafried and um d'agostino talking about cancer as a metabolic disease but they couldn't join us today so this is a really oh uh, yeah we we don't we also have Miriam Kalamanian who talks had does a really practical session on how to implement therapeutic carbohydrate restriction um, for cancer. So it's a really interesting chapter with a lot of amazing contributors, and I'm really excited to have some of those amazing contributors here today. So let me start by reading the abstract to you all so that you can get an idea about about what what is in this chapter. All right. So, since the discovery of DNA, the metabolic theory of cancer has been sidelined for ge genetic research, because we all think of genetics as the cause of cancer today, but it really wasn't always, and it isn't necessarily. Yet cancer continues to rise. New research recaptures mitochondria as the driver, while upregulation of oncogenes and tumor suppressor mutations are recognized as downstream of the damage um, to oxidative phosphorylation, which is in the mitochondria. Despite the prevalence of the somatic or genetic mutation theory of cancer, there are numerous inconsistencies, and this chapter goes into those. In contrast, it appears that all cancers are characterized by dysfunctional mitochondria, whereas not all cancers are, are characterized by dysfunctional genes. Cancer pre-1960s was a rare disease, all of which has changed as diets have. Um, Professor Seafried goes into the press pulse therapy and ketogenic diets um, as effective therapies for cancer due to cancer's selective metabolism of glucose and glutamine, which is the Warburg effect, specifically glucose, in combination with the non-fermentability of ketones. So we're going to discuss all of this um, during this chat today. Um, some dietary aspects are individualized to the patient and cancer, but follow this general protocol, this press pulse pr pr protocol can or keto protocol. Fasting induces additional selective stress on cancer, and that's what Nasha and Martha speak about in their sections in this chapter, so we're going to talk more about that. And with cancer genetic research stagnating and metabolic approaches showing much more promise, this perspective op offers a new path forward, and that's what this chapter is all about, this new path forward lo um, looking at cancer as a metabolic disease rather than primarily a genetic disease. So let me tell you a little bit more about the authors that we have here today. So Nasha Winters is a global healthcare authority and best-selling author in integrative cancer care and research. She consults with physicians around the world. She's been working in the healthcare industry for 25 years and is a, is a nationally board certified naturopathic doctor. She also educates hundreds of professionals um, with regards to educational programs related to cancer, as well as healthcare institutions and the public on incorporated integrative therapies into cancer to enhance the outcomes. Um, she's currently focused on opening a comprehensive metabolic oncology hospital, which I had no idea about. It sounds super exciting. Um, and a research institute in the US where this best standard of practice of care for cancer um, can be offered to patients, which it sounds, sounds so exciting, Nasha. So it's definitely wonderful to have your contribution here. And then we have Prof Tim Noakes, who studied at the University of Cape Town, obtaining his MBCHB, which is a medical doctor degree and an MD and DSC in medicine in exercise science. He's now an adjunct professor at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology, also in Cape Town, South Africa, following his retirement from the research unit of exercise science and sports medicine. In 1995, he was co-founder of the now prestigious Sports Science Institute of South Africa. He's been rated as an A1 scientist by the National Research Foundation of South Africa for a third five-year term. And in 2008, he received the order of um, Mapungubwe. Um, and he's got lots of books, articles, 
um, very like cited by more than 21, 21,000 times in literature. So I'm, I'm not going to carry on because I feel like Prof Noakes is difficult to get through his whole blurb, but we all know he's an incredibly respected and accomplished um, scientist. Then we have Martha Tettenborn, who is a registered dietitian and a certified primal health coach with over 30 years of experience working in many areas of nutrition. She currently works in long-term care with a focus on nursing homes and gerontology. Her private healthcare practice, The Cancer Doula, promotes a low-carb, whole food-based approach to disease prevention and cancer symptom management. When diagnosed with type 1 ovarian cancer, Martha began exploring the research of the disease and discovered the science of cancer metabolism. This led her to develop the use of a protocol of a ketogenic diet with targeted therapeutic fasting to significantly impact her response to chemotherapy. Um, inspired by her own journey, Martha wants to help others to see cancer differently as an experience that will give you strength, wisdom, and more love for your body and life than ever before. So thank you all for joining us. So let's dive right into discussion around the topics that are covered in this chapter. And I would like to start with Prof. Tim Noakes, because he starts this this cancer this um, this chapter off um, by discussing the evidence, um, historical epidemiological evidence, if you will, of cancer being a modern disease. And he takes us through various cultures and societies through the ages and looks at um, at very well known venerated uh, venerable scientists uh, from the day who who or anthropologists who looked at these societies and investigated the prevalence of cancer within them. And he talks about their findings and then he talks about what happens when um, modern diet is introduced and what happens to cancer incidents and he also compares it to the westernized societies and he leads us to a conclusion which then uh, from there the chapter moves on more into the physiology and biochemistry of cancer and nutrition so i think it's a really good place to start prof why do you say that cancer is a modern disease can you take us through some of that story and how you've come to that conclusion Sure. Well, I think it all begins, in my mind, from, from Bill Jamar Stefansson, who lived in the Arctic with the Inuit for 10 years or so, and then came back to New York and refused to eat the conventional diet and wanted to go back to eating the Inuit diet. And he lived in hospital for three months and showed that he didn't die because they, they said, you're going to die from this. And so he wrote a series of books, which I've quoted widely, and his first, last book, his final book, was Is Cancer a Modern Disease? Disease of Civilization. Now, that book is out of print, and I would never have had a copy of it if it hadn't been that I was meant to go to one conference that was stopped over the period of the COVID. And the person who invited me said, he had managed to get one copy of the book and he said you're the man who needs this book so so it was really reading that book that that made me uh put together all this information and what i did was simply to go through the literature and you know one scientific paper leads you to another one to another one and so i have gone through i think it was a hundred and odd papers and references all of which make reference to the fact that cancer is very, very uncommon in populations that continue to eat their traditional diets. And living in, in Africa, one of the features of what happened when the medical doctors came to Africa, the 1700s, 1800s, they immediately noticed that the local populations had very rare cancers. And so that was one of the mythologies or mythologies with which one grew up in a medical training, that it was mentioned in passing. It wasn't really given any credence in any particular way, because it's only an anecdote. So what I've tried to do in this chapter is to put all the anecdotes together, because anecdotes actually do become data. And if all these people observed a lack of cancer in these populations, and that there was no reason why they should report it, except that that's what they observed. So we go through all the communities um, and we go right through the African communities where the people have reported that there was no cancer. 
I mentioned the next was the Arctic, uh, the Inuit, and what Stefansson made the point was that when he lived with these people, they mostly are naked when they're it, mostly naked. So he, if they had breast cancer, for example, the women, he would have been able to see it. If they had other cancers, that would have become apparent. But there was no evidence for, for that being the case. We then go to North and South American populations, particularly the, the Plains Indians, who were examined. And a lot of doctors lived with them with time. And again, no cancers. Then in the Australian countries and the Pacific Islanders, no cancers in the, in the traditional populations. Robert McCarrison, I think we spoke about him at the on our last talk from India. He went to see the Hunzas living in the Himalayas, no cancers. And then there were a couple of other textbooks which put it all together. There was one by Dr. Friedrich Hoffmann, and he wrote the definitive textbook on cancer at, at the time. And he said there was cancer was uncommon. So then we go to what happens when the diet changes and when particularly when sugar and the other dietary changes occur, then the cancer rates start to rise. I pay great attention to the Warburg hypothesis and particularly the work of the book Ra Ravenous, which was published within the last year and which was so important in going through Warburg's history and describing his hypothesis, describing how he was living in Berlin and he survived through the Second World War. He then, uh, by then he'd obviously developed his hypothesis. He won the Nobel Prize, but it wasn't for that type of the Warburg hypothesis. And up till 1953, that was the going, con the going hypothesis. But unfortunately, then DNA was discovered and all of a sudden it went to genetics. And despite <laughs> the... Can you tell us what, what the Warburg hypothesis is so that our audience is all on the same page? Sure. So what Warburg found was when he looked at cancer cells or a particular line of cancer cells, that they had a reduced capacity to produce ATP through the mitochondria, mitochondrial ATP production, so that most of their energy was coming from glycolysis, the breakdown of glycogen to lactate. So his hypothesis was that these cells are growing so fast that they become hypoxic. And as a consequence, they're damaged and they can't generate energy by ATP. And he was pretty sure that he had the, the explanation for cancer. But unfortunately, it was subsequently discovered, uh, probably in the 50s or the 60s, that in fact, can, some cancer cells are able to produce ATP aerobically. So it didn't foot all the story, but there's been a big comeback towards Warburg's hypothesis uh, that the mitochondria are involved. And the, the, we finish up with, with a lovely quote that the, that the cancer cells have got so much energy from glycolysis that they say, well, we've got so much energy, we might as well just keep growing. And so that's the hypothesis that the, they have an excess of energy from from the glycolytic pathway, as I understand it. So, the, just so everyone's clear, the glycolytic pathway would be metabolizing glucose, which is carbohydrate. So, in order for all of this to hold true, it means that cancer cells are eating glucose or carbohydrates in order to survive. And if they don't have that, then that's where it goes on to potentially helping with cancer by starving them of their chosen fuel. Um, yeah, sorry to interrupt, Prof. So I do also give some of the biology that may be involved, um, but because I'm not an expert, I only just give it as an introduction, which other people in the in the chapter will describe in great detail. But it's clear that there are there is enough evidence that the Warburg effect is involved in cancer, and so I give some of the evidence for that. The other part of the chapter is how things changed and when they change, and they change once sugar comes into the into the diet, or wheat and sugar. 
And the one theory is that sugar has played a much bigger role in cancer production than we currently realize. That if you take all the changes, it might well be fructose that is driving it. And the person who really opened my eyes was Sam Apple in his book, Ravenous, which again was about Warburg. And he comes to the suggestion that it's that the cancer follows the sugar and particularly the fructose. So I'm very happy with this chapter because it's got a hundred anecdotes of where the evidence shows that these disease cancer is uncommon amongst the population to continue to eat their traditional diets. And I think that the evidence is strong enough. It, Although it's anecdotal, it's strong enough to make a very strong case that cancer is indeed a disease of nutrition and of civilization. And the civilization is, i.e., the, the diet that we're currently eating. So civilized nutrition, modern, modern nutrition. <laughs> well, Prof, I, I I think that's a really good summary of kind of the path or the story that you take us through, um, which starts off the chapter. And I, I see that you end off, and you've mentioned this now, um, about the role, very shortly, about the role of fructose and glucose. And then you even touch on overnutrition and you touch on insulin. So I'm wondering if before we move on to maybe Nasha and Martha a little bit, could you kind of prize those apart for us? What, Where is fructose involved? Where is glucose involved? Is overnutrition involved, as you say? And if it is, I think you, you quote Dole and Pedro, who say that overnutrition may account for 35% of all cancer deaths in the US. Um, but overnutrition, I mean, is that that could be eating too much fat or eating too much protein? So, so I was just wondering if you could maybe prize apart for us the role of fructose, the role of glucose, the role of just eating too much, um, and the role of insulin, because you mentioned all of those towards the end of your section in the chapter. Yeah, thanks. A great question. I think that up to the last 10 years, before, when we didn't really understand insulin resistance, and it's suddenly become to the fore, and particularly with this encyclopedia, we're really pushing it forward. People didn't understand that people don't get fat just because of overnutrition. They have there are other reasons. And I think that the insulin resistance story is is that all those conditions you're describing are all part of the same package, the insulin resistance package and the high carbohydrate diets. So my answer would be that it is individuals are predisposed because they are insulin resistant. They're then exposed to a high carbohydrate diet of which sugar makes up and fructose makes up an increasing proportion over the last 20 years, even it's continued to rise with the production of high fructose corn syrup, et cetera. So that even though our sugar intake may not have gone up, the high fructose corn syrup has increased dramatically in the world. That exposure raises your insulin all the time, and ultimately the, the, the insulin may then be the driver of the, the abnormalities that cause the cancer. You know, I just I want to make the point that the reason why humans, we've sp spoken about this before, the used reason why people burn carbohydrate is because we're trying to regulate our blood glucose concentration and keep our insulin low. And that we don't need the carbohydrate. And it's so foreign to, to our biology of the last 2 million years. So we keep eating the carbohydrate, spiking our glucose, and then spiking the insulin. And it's that repetitive insult, which ultimately has to be a big, big factor in all the diseases. And I would suspect cancer will be one of them. So you're quite right. I do finish up with talking about insulin resistance and the evidence for that. And I think hopefully that just leads into the experts can tell you exactly which, how fructose acts or how insulin acts. I just introduced would, it with Would with that be because of insulin's anabolic effect? Is that, is that the role, is that the way it would be promoting cancer because it promotes growth? Yeah, I, again, I'd, I'll, I'll pass on that one. <laughs> all, <laughs> I, all we know, just let's <laughs> emphasize the point that hyperinsulinemia is linked to cancer. So hyperinsulinemia is a, is a risk factor for, for many cancers. And, and that brings us back to the chapter one, where I spoke with you, Prof, and when we spoke um, with Catherine Crofts as well, and she spoke to us about how insulin um, is raised 
across the board and affects so many different organs. Um, and you can't just be myopic in your vision and look at it only with regards to blood glucose regulation, but you need to also look at its, its impact on bone health and its impact on, you know, quickly dividing, you know, cells that maybe have dysfunctional mitochondria, for example, or, um, yeah, so I think, I think it's looking at insulin um, from a systemic, bigger vision, bigger, like, eagle eye point of view, um, then you can maybe see why, why this is just another application uh, where high insulin could be driving ill health. So thank and, you and so let much. Make, let me make a point finally that if we had insulin levels on populations in a million years ago, or the populations who continue to eat their traditional diets, they would be substantially lower most of the day compared to mm. what we face today. So yeah. then we would might be able to say, well, the one thing that has really changed has been blood insulin concentrations over the last. 200 300 years yeah and that, that makes so much sense and then we can go into why and then we can look at the as di at the diet and how that's changed for those populations like you do in this chapter great thank you prof so nasha i would like you to take us from here um and you know in the absence of of Professor Seafried, who would be going into this, and I, I don't think any of us would want to di dive as deeply into that topic anyway as he would, because it's <laughs> Facebook Live is no place for the level of depth that Professor Seafried goes into. Um, so I think, you know, as amazing as he is, there's no way we could possibly cover um, his topic in, on this format. But perhaps, Nasha, you could dive in, in a little bit more depth into the role of glucose, maybe fructose, insulin, um, and maybe just a little bit, because we can't dive into the deep biochem here. It's just not the platform for it. And please, everyone, go buy the textbook if you want it, because it's in there. Um, but maybe you could give us a brief overview before we move over into fasting. Um, so yeah, so basically, Tell us a little bit more about this mitochondrial dysfunction because uh, Prof Noakes did mention it, but I feel like um, if we could get a deeper understanding of what all of this means about fermentation, glycolysis, hypoxia, all these big scientific words, could you try and, and kind of break it down for us, get us to understand what potentially is going on with this metabolic theory of or the metabolic kind of way of looking at cancer rather than the genetic way and take us through some of the fuels and how that impacts on this if you if you don't mind we're so thank god you're not expecting me to speak like dr <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> as much as i understand biochemistry i am not a biochemistry teacher um i always think more in analogies and i think about how do i need to learn this and because i also spend an enormous amount of my time training physicians i will tell you right now most physicians do not know how to speak about how dr seafried speaks about this it's not a disservice we just are in the the trenches with trying to explain this to our patients in a meaningful way that in, in, in inspires them to make the necessary yeah. changes. So, so that's why you're perfect to explain it to us yeah. in this platform. <laughs> no pressure, good deal. So specifically, I'm going to simplify very much here. So what I love that um, Professor Noakes brought up was um, Otto Warburg's discovery was, you know, there's, there's elements to it. So sort of this Warburg effect of, hey, this is how cancers grow without um, oxygen and then down the road, oops, they actually can use oxygen. So let's focus in on what we did learn and still seems to remain pretty robust and that we're doing more and more research on, which is the starting point of all of this is at the function of the um, number of and the efficiency of our mitochondria kind of plain and simple here. And so what we all learned in like sixth grade biology class was that the only role of mitochondria was just to produce ATP. And we all just kind of knew it as the mitochondria and moved on. That's all I even learned in medical school back in the nineties. Right. And, and, and likely what students are still learning in medical schools today, we've since learned that they have many more roles. They are sensing agents and they are signaling agents. So they take in information and they put information out into the body, all right? And they're not just sensitive to what's happening inside of our body. They're sensitive to the things around our bodies as well, which is very fascinating. We'll touch on that here in just a moment. 
So simply put, what has what I think is so interesting about Warburg's studies and the, the um, Bovary's ideas of somatic mutation theory being a genetic disease is that it's not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Genetics are involved in a, upwards of 10% of cancer cases. We can say that, yet 90% cannot be um, described as genetic dysfunction within our mind, you know, within the cancering process. But what we can show is even that 10% that has genetic um, underpinnings, it still needs to go upstream from that, which is the mitochondria we are learning are sort of the protector of the genome, not sort of, they are the protector of the genome. And so if our mitochondria are functioning well, they're efficient, they're effective, they're numerous in the right amounts in the right tissues of the body, because we need different amounts of mitochondria in different parts of the body, and they need to do different roles in different parts of the body. If they're in in order, then we are more resilient to those genetic damaging you know, effects, our DNA is protected. And so what you're asking is like, what makes the mitochondria kind of go off the rails? And Dr. Noakes brought it up so beautifully that a lot has changed in a very short period of time. You know, 10,000 years, 10, years ago, we were still hunting and gathering, right? There was massive amounts of feast and famine. And we were in a local regional, I mean, talk about eating locally, you know, that <laughs> they did it best. Um, and so then we moved into the, uh, you know, agricultural phase. And of course, that's made big, big changes in the last 200 years or so. But that's where things started to really change is that we weren't putting out as much energy to take in these food process, you know, so the more carbs we added, the less energy we were putting out to receive them. And that really shifted in the late 1700s, early 1800s, when we moved into the industrial food revolution, we started adding sugar and processed flour and grains into the diet more strategically. In the last hundred years, we've completely monocropped into these massive, I mean, we, we are corn, soy, and wheat today, like we are what we eat. So we're grains, we're monocropped grains is what we all are now, which has really thrown us off. And so that's just one component, but also things like the incandescent light bulb, 1879, I think is when that came out. So light changed. That means our work and lifestyle changed. That means our exposures changed. So when I mentioned that the mitochondria are also sensitive and sensing of things outside of us, also light changes. So what we're now learning in this field is the mitochondria, as I mentioned, taking information in, processing it and putting information out, that's gotten bogged up, that's gotten really funky. So it could be epigenetics, things from previous generations that are imprinting on the behavior and expression of our DNA and of our mitochondrial health and wealth. It could be just the fuel sources of what we're actually feeding it that's making a difference and not just the amount of carbohydrates, but even the quality of the food. You know, are, is it loaded with other endocrine disrupting chemicals? Is it loaded with things like antibiotics, which also spike insulin? Is it loaded with um, pesticides, antibiotics, hormones, other things that are starting to have other signaling input into our cells? What about our microbiome, how it interacts in that? What about our um, perfusion of oxygen and circulation, which was already alluded to in the hypoxia discussion? What about our hormone balance? What about our um, immune system function? And on and on, you start to realize that there are these accumulating drops in our mitochondrial bucket that impact the way the mitochondria behave. That is metabolic health. We never understood the way we do now. We sort of had this understanding like, oh, they make ATP. So that's a metabolic process, but we didn't understand the signaling pathways. The expression of those signaling pathways are also metabolic processes. And it is impacted by everything we put in on and around us, everything we ingest, even everything we think. And so these are the things that make it very challenging for our standard of care approaches today. We like to do the one target, and one treatment, it will never be effective because it's not a single causative factor and there's not a single treatment strategy. And so this is where our colleagues in the metabolic field, even in that, like even Dr. Seafried might get more myopic of this is just glutamine and glucose, but then what also spikes up insulin? Guess what? Stress, cortisol spikes your insulin. So does exposure to light at night. So two nights of bad sleep spikes your insulin growth factor. 
No one's talking about that, right? Or a lot of the pharmaceuticals used in the oncology world today. So pre-drugs of steroids with their chemotherapy, for instance, PARP inhibitors, aromatase inhibitors, a lot of the TK, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, these drugs themselves spike insulin. They create metabolic syndrome. So they keep creating even more of the, the soil in which we got sick. And so these are the conversations that I love that this textbook is offering is taking us, yes, there's a chapter specific to cancer, but it could very well have been a chapter on hypertension or diabetes or, or obesity or mental health. All of these things are functioning from that same eroded metabolic mitochondrial signaling disruption. So that was a lot to speak to in there, and I'm not being as eloquent on it as Dr. Seafried would be to the specifics, but if you keep it simple, again, just to reiterate, what comes in affects our mitochondria of what is put out into the system. So you can create resilience or create disease dependent on that information. Thank you, Nash. I think, I think you've touched on so many pertinent points here, and I think it goes back to what um, Prof Noakes keeps putting in his chapters the diet, um, the diet or the diseases of modern commerce, um, and I think it kind of ties that that ties everything together, because yeah. yes, you're right. We're not just in this textbook. I think that's where I think I'd like to highlight what you've just said, which is yes, um, like all other physiology or nutrition textbooks, we've gone and divided the human body and the conditions up into separate chapters. <laughs> right, we've got cancer, we've got endocrine, we've got neurology, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the truth is, and I think this is where the first chapter hopefully will tie it all together, um, especially with Catherine Croft's section in chapter one, which says insulin resistance as a unifying or, in, you know, as a unifying cause of disease. And I think if we can just hold that top of mind, um, and you clearly are, Nasha, um, but I think for the audience and for myself included, I think with all of these discussions where we're breaking things down now into cancer or whatever it is for the next talk, just we must remember that there is a unifying hypothesis here. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is that, okay, they're not all going to be exactly the same, but there is something that has gone awry at a certain time during human evolution or human development or whatever, where we have started living differently, eating differently. And the insults that have come with that have driven disease so that we are now in the state of, of chronic disease of lifestyle, which have overtaken um, infectious diseases, respiratory disease and the things that used to kill us. Um, and so really it's about looking and finding what, identifying what are those things. And in this book, one of the key things is diet um, and that's where this book really focuses so yes all of those other things and we do touch on them in the textbook as you say Nasha we touch on you know the role of stress and physical activity and things like that we even have a whole chapter on exercise but um, the focus of this textbook is on diet because diet is one of the biggest if not the biggest we can argue but that um, influencing factor within all of this and it definitely plays a huge role in driving insulin up so um, so I think we must remember the holistic view, both from a body perspective, that the same, it's the same insults that are driving all these disease processes, as you've said. Um, but also just remember that while we might be focusing on therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, because it is a huge role player, and I would argue maybe the most crucial role player, it is not the only role player. Um, and it's really important that we remember that. So thank you very much, Dr. Winters, for reminding us about that. And I, what, I think just to reiterate a piece that you brought up here, this is also what we have the most control over. And mm. in a state of having a diagnosis like cancer or some other chronic or life-threatening illness, the, the sense of loss of control can be consuming, can be overwhelming. I mean, Martha and I both walked that journey. Um, and so to speak from firsthand experience of that, but it's really nice when there is something that you actually can do, that you are given, you, you are far more powerful than you're led to believe when it comes to nutrition. Because on one level, you have your 
standard of care physicians who less than 25% of the medical schools in the United States even offer an elective course in nutrition. So there's a, a, a disconnect there that it's just like, you shouldn't be taking any um, advice from me on how to work on your car. Just like you probably shouldn't take any advice from an, onco from an oncologist who's <laughs> never had nutrition training. Um, those are things to keep in mind that this, so patients are then told, don't worry about it. Just don't lose weight. Just eat whatever you want. You know, this is not a time to, to, you know, keep yourself away from the things that you love like that it's like this is the we need to reframe yeah. these conversations of this is yeah. exactly the time to grab the reins and and drive this train down a very different track and that's where mm -hmm. i think um where this book you, you mentioned like focuses in on mm -hmm. one of the critical foundational pieces to do just that but i also want people because when i hear the mm -hmm. other flip to that is when people say I do everything right with my diet. I'm eating perfectly. I'm my ketones are great. My GKI is fantastic. But then I see them on at 2 a.m. on Facebook, you know, like I see their time stamp the next morning, or that they're living on a golf course exposed to massive amounts of glyphosate, or they're in a relationship or a job they hate that's clearly keeping them in a place. Like those things will contribute. You cannot eat your way into health just as much as you can to poison your way into health. So you do have to still keep it in context of the whole ism, but the most powerful foundational piece is our diet. Well, thank you, Nasha. I couldn't agree more. And I, I think you also led us a segue into what Martha and I would definitely as dietitians would have learned, which I remember doing my oncology block during my um, internship year as a dietitian, um, in a very big hospital here in Cape Town, South Africa, called Hurdeskir. And we, I mean, we, what we wanted to do with the cancer patients was get food in them. So we would feed them this, this milkshake thing, uh, powdered milkshake, which is basically just a whole lot of sugar and carbs, mainly, uh, with some vitamins and minerals added into it, you know, think, well, you know, it tastes nice and sweet as a milkshake, come on, you can drink it. And he, he really, and, and having been surrounded by people in my life who've come down with cancer, and then, you know, it's this narrative of eat, now's just what you said, now's not the time to rein in, just eat whatever you can eat. If that's like a whole lot of sweeties, eat the sweeties. You know, if it's chocolate, if it's these milkshake things that are full of carbs and sugar and, you know, seed oils, eat them. You know, it's absolutely fine. You're so skinny anyway. You're getting skinnier by the day. Why not eat these things? Meanwhile, we're not realizing that that's not okay. Um, it's really not okay because we're driving the disease process when we could be turning it around. Um, so it's actually, yeah, it's really, really terrible. So Martha brings me to you. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, I know you speak about fasting and chemo and we'll get there, um, but could you start us off by telling us a little about fasting in general um, and how this fits into, I know this is Nasha's, Nasha's topic in the textbook, but I, I would like to hear a little bit from you as well. Nasha, please feel free to weigh in here as well. But tell us a little about fasting and cancer and fasting and chemo and maybe, yeah, let's start there. Let's start there. Okay. Um, yeah, so both fasting and keto diets, I think, are powerful tools in, in tr dealing with someone who has a, a, a diagnosis. And you're right, like my, can my dietitian training was a lot earlier than yours, <laughs> um, hence the gray hair. Um, but, you know, it was exactly the same thing. It was... All we had as a tool was high energy, high protein diet guidelines. And that was, you know, take your piece of toast and don't eat it dry. Eat it with butter and peanut butter and honey and, you know, have a big glass of milk on the side or God forbid, one of those nutritional supplement products that is, you know, canola oil, soy protein and uh, corn, corn sugar is basically the top three ingredients. And that was all we knew is like help people to not lose weight through despite the side effects, like despite the cancer treatment side effects, we weren't ever thinking about the cancer itself, really. Um, our job as dietitians was to keep them from not losing weight as they went through cancer treatment for the most part. Um, so, you know, like I say, when I got a cancer diagnosis, I, I was already in the realm of low carb and I wasn't about to take that as, you know, what I had learned 30 years ago as the, the status quo. And that's what sort of sent me down the path. 
Um, but I had no idea that cancer metabolism even existed as a thing until I started looking and, you know, then taking it right back to the, the insulin balance issues, which of course are a part of what I had learned in my low carb training through Pima Health Coach Institute and, and my other reading. So off I went down the rabbit hole of, of cancer metabolism and discovered Dr. Safried and Miriam Kalamian and, um, and Dom D'Agostino and doc, uh, Dr. Walter Longo, who um, was in particular working with fasting and chemotherapy. And that's, that's where I ended up kind of focusing because I was, um, despite it being stage one, it had been ruptured, it was considered a spill, and I was um, required to do further surgery and some chemotherapy. So, um, so that's kind of how I ended up in the, the realm of fasting. And, um, and Dr. Longo had done a lot of work with fasting and, and cancer cells and the impact of fasting on cancer cells. But then he got, also got into the impact of fasting on healthy cells. And, and that's where it really starts to come home to roost that you can impact on side effects because chemotherapy drugs and I mean, other cancer treatments as well, but particularly chemotherapy drugs are these blunt we weapons that are just aimed at um, chemical signals of fast metabolism, basically, because cancers, you know, one of the hallmarks of cancer is that it cannot stop growing. Um, and so if you can, um, if you can find a, a, a mechanism in that cancer cell and aim your drug at it, then you can make those cells um you know, not function properly, which will hopefully cause them to die. That's the theory. But I mean, healthy cells have those same, um, those same metabolic processes going on. But it but through fasting, um, we can actually slow down our healthy cells. And and that was um, mind blowing for me, that if I could slow down the metabolism of my healthy cells, then the the um, the target of the chemotherapy isn't flashing quite as bright and you can actually make the chemotherapy miss your healthy cells at the same time you are providing that um, that pressure that dr safery talks about in his press pulse theory through the ketogenic diet through intermittent fasting or time restricted eating um, you are are providing the the pressure that makes it difficult for cancer cells to get the glucose and the the fuel that they want um, and also the glutamine, if you do it right, you're, you're moderating protein, not a lot. It's not a high protein diet by any means. It's a, it's a moderated protein diet. Um, and, and so you, you reduce the fuels, you put pressure on the cancer cells, and then you hit them with the pulse as he, as he refers to it, um, which in this case is chemotherapy. Um, and so the cancer cells are in a stressed and weakened condition this theory. And, and so the, the, um, the, the chemotherapy is more effective, but for me, what was, was vitally important and what nobody seemed to be talking about was the fact that if you can quiet down those metabolic processes in your healthy cells through the fasting, then the, the chemotherapy doesn't find them. And therefore you have fewer side effects. And if you have fewer side effects, then you bounce back from the chemo faster and you don't lose the weight. So people kind of go, oh, I couldn't, you know, I can't fast for three days because I'll lose weight. But it's like, if you have the chemo and then you're sick and you can't eat for four or five days, you're going to lose weight, right? So this was a way of doing it that, that, that you know, stresses the cancer cells, protects your healthy cells. Um, and, and allows you to then eat, um, through like, literally, I never missed a meal. I did six rounds of chemo. I never missed a meal that I hadn't planned to miss. And, um, in fact, I never missed making a meal. I was never horizontal. I was never damaged. I was bald, but you know, I was never damaged, um, in terms of my GI tract and all that kind of stuff. And my energy level was never knocked so low that I couldn't be the the cook and bottle washer in my house, which is the role that I prefer to take. And sometimes it was just getting up off the couch or off my recliner and making bacon and eggs and then, you know, crawling back into my recliner and that, but that was, 
such a different experience to what a lot of people have. Um, so when you're, you know, when we were those, those people millions of years ago that Dr. Noakes talks about um, on the savannah, like we didn't eat every day. We had these periods of feast and then a period of famine or, or, or fasting. And there is no way short of voluntary, you know, avoidance of food for us to continue to experience what we, um, what we evolved to do well with. So, yeah, so we, we suggest fasting as a, um, a strategy for using around cancer treatments. It does a, a variety of things It it allows the body to be deeper in ketosis. Um, if you're, you know, if you're already, even if you're not following a, a ketogenic diet, generally within a day or two of, of starting um, a fast, you will start to produce ketones. So that's helpful um, because they support your healthy cells through the, the process as well. Um, but as, as, as Nisha said, like empowerment is such a huge part of this as a, as a cancer um, I don't want to say patient, but as a person with cancer, once you get that diagnosis, you are never again, not a person with cancer. I say it's like becoming a parent. It doesn't matter what age your kid is. It doesn't matter even if they've like passed away or they live on another continent, you are never again, not a parent. And, and it's like that with cancer. It's always there kind of in the back of your mind. And so you don't need to live in fear when you have these strategies like the ketogenic diet or a low carb, whole foods, animal based, um, kind of clean, local, seasonal eating. There's, there's all those adjectives you can add to it. You know, it goes on forever. But um, if you can eat clean, quote on with my air quotes, um, and and then use these powerful strategies like the fasting to get through treatments or to increase the, the ketone um, load that you're carrying into treatments, because that's also found to be very helpful, particularly with radiation. There's a lot of um, research that has been done that supports being in deep ketosis when you go into radiation treatments. Um, so, you know, fasting pre-radiation, which is a harder thing because radiation tends to be every day. Um, so it's not like the extended fast. But um, and using possibly some medium chain triglycerides or ketone supplements to boost your ketone levels as you go into those radiation treatments. Again, it's that, um, you know, weakening the cancer cells, supporting your healthy cells, and then hitting them with whatever that pulse is. So Wow, that's awesome. Martha, thank you so much. I think you described that so well. I was kind of imagining in my mind, you know, these I don't know, snipers who are honed in on on only the runners, you know, only the people who are running and the people who are walking, they still might get hit because they're moving relatively fast, but not as fast as the runners. But as soon as you can like slow them down to slow-mo, then the snipers aren't going to focus on them. They're just not moving fast enough and they're going to be spared the bullets. And I kind yeah. of, I don't know, in my mind, I was imagining this picture where the runners of the cancer cells, you know, they're, they're moving really fast, they're growing really fast. And so if chemo is going to focus in on something, it's going to be the fast movers. And, yeah. you know, your normal cells are still dividing, so they might get a few hits. But if you can slow them down by fasting and avoid them getting those shots, then they stay good. And it's all the runners who are getting killed, which is exactly what you want. So They'll actually go into a quiescent mode where, where you know, autophagy, autophagy starts like to hibernating. Take like they're just, they're, they're in hibernation until the food supply starts up again and they get that signal. Okay, there's food we can, you know, the, that's awesome. the, the whole the whole immune system can be kind of rebuilt in the space of a three day fast, like all kinds of wonderful things happen, but I call it stealth mode. So your <laughs> healthy like cells go into stealth <laughs> mode. And then the chemo just kind of flies right over the top and it heads for those ones with the big red flashing lights. You know? Oh, it's awesome. I love it. And I think it's so exciting that something so relatively simple and so natural is naturally part of our, our evolutionary history, what humans have done, what we still do, especially in, in religions, you know, whether that's Ramadan or Lent or whatever. Um, it's just so natural. So I think I think that's awesome to to think about that. And I, I know we haven't even spoken about the crux of the issue in this in this topic, because the 
people, uh, namely Seafried and Kellermanian, who actually speak about therapeutic carbohydrate restriction aren't here today. But the majority of the chapter is actually about that. So, and I know we've touched on that, which is ketones. You know, we're getting those ketones up, we're getting the glucose down. The glucose must go down because that's, you know, what's feeding the cancer cells. We've touched on glutamine, which Seafried does touch on in his sections as well, because glutamine is an amino acid that is very plentiful in the body and you can restrict it in small little bouts. And he speaks about that. Um, but basically, let's just focus on the glucose for simplicity's sake. You get the glucose down by limiting your carbs. You get the ketones up by doing ketogenic diets and by fasting. And the reason you want the ketones to be up is because cancer cells because of this Warburg effect can't use ketones right so you're starving them if you're lowering their fuel and raising the fuel that your other cells can use which are ketones and fat so you have enough ketones and fat your other cells are good they go into stealth mode whenever you zap them with with chemo and then you have you have your so the ketones are supplying that your glucose is low the cancer is being zapped and it's being starved and i mean it's no wonder that the strategy is is gaining traction and gaining traction and gaining evidence as well and um you know miriam kalamanian does such a brilliant section in this chapter of really making it practical um you know giving to saying this is how the diet looks this is what you do these are the different forms of it this is it's just it's really really easy to apply um, and very practical and she uses tables and graphs which are really really brilliant as well so I think everyone will find that really really useful now we're almost out of time and there are I think there are a few questions um, let me just quickly have a look I'm very bad at, at multitasking which is why I do fine with hosting these things as long as I can focus on the conversation <laughs> as soon as there's a there's a question I'm like okay let me focus on the question um, so I'll give you an. I'll, let me give you an anecdote. Give you a chance to break. Okay, good. Thank you, Prof. I was approached by a, a pilot for a major company overseas, and he said he had a renal cancer which spread to his lungs, had metastasized to stage four, and for some reason he decided. So he gets the chest X-ray and he decides I'm going to fast for seven days. He goes back for the second X-ray, and the doctor said, "What happened? It didn't, <laughs> hadn't all gone, but all the cancers had shrunk." So he said, that's the way I'm going to survive. And he's alive and well and got back to flying. To get back to flying, he must have been cancer free. So that's my fantastic anecdote about why you should fast if you have cancer. <laughs> and, and Prof, the most amazing thing is that there are just so many anecdotes. Um, yeah. And one of my favorite is a case study, um, which in, in, I think it's written by Alsaka and Seafried and D'Agostino. Um, about an Egyptian, I think it was an Egyptian guy with, with a glioblastoma that was shrunk enough that it could be removed. Um, and that's something that people die from. It's like, if you get glioblastoma, you're dead. It's just a matter of time. And using the strategy, the press pulse strategy with fasting and therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, ketones and low glucose and pulse treatments with um, glutamine modulating stuff, this the the glioblastoma shrunk enough that it was small enough to remove and he's absolutely healthy um and, and there's so many anecdotes there's really not really an anecdotal thing anymore you know and i think that's what's so exciting so there are a few questions the first question is um from ann brennan who asks if you have hyperinsulinemia would that have a different effect on allowing the fat to be released so in other words if you're already sick from being in this hyperinsulinemic state would you be able to benefit your healthy cells by going keto and releasing the fat because you're, the insulin is presumably keeping the fat in storage? So how would a hyperinsulinemic person benefit? Well, that's the whole, I mean, almost you have to remember the studies show that more than, that less than 6.8% of people in modern times are metabolically um, flexible and healthy, which means that probably closer to 90 to 93% of the population is hyperinsulinemic. So this is precisely the mechanism that we're addressing with the fasted state, with the, th with the therapeutic ketosis, is it drives that insulin down and is very impactful. So this is the, your, your hyperinsulinemic state was made for this uh, therapeutic approach. I don't, I don't, maybe oversimplifying, but I'd love to hear from our colleagues as well. Yeah, exactly. It's going to just, it's going to lower the insulin, right? And then it's going to, that's how it has its effect. Exactly. So I'm, I'm going to move on to the next question, which is, is it true that mitochondria will preferentially use fat over sugar to produce ATP from Ian, from Ian Gorner? 
Well, not preferentially that's, you have to push it, but it will be more, it will make more ATP. The fats will make more energy. Um, and so you have to kind of push it a little bit. It's not that it's preferentially wanting the fats because it will default. It's kind of lazy, lazy uh, approach is taken on the glucose. Um, but when you take away the glucose and you move into the fat, you actually are making more uh, ATP. You're make, you're being more efficient. And as Prof Noak says, like, you know, we were designed to store fat on our body, you know, hundreds of thousands of calories worth, very portable, very dense, very easy to take with us when we need it. We store about 400 calories worth of carbohydrates in our liver and a little more in our, you know, like we, we weren't designed to store carbs. And when you give your body lots of carbs, the mitochondria needs to burn them first because we are not supposed to have them floating around in our system. Great. I think I can just add on that because that's absolutely correct. My view is very simply that your muscle and liver glycogen content determine what the muscles will burn. The muscles will burn. If you're full of carbohydrate, you have to burn carbohydrate for exactly the reason Marta has described. We did some fabulous studies in the 1990s, which you know you only read them and understand them 20 or 30 years later, where we made people, we gave them low carbohydrate diets made them exercise and so they would start exercise with low muscle glycogen they would be burning fat so we said fine what happens if we give glucose infusions because of course that's going to stop the fat oxidation it didn't touch it absolutely the body is designed to burn the carbohydrate it's got to get rid of it and that is across the board and if you start with no glycogen you will burn fat all the time and of course your insulin will be low so your insulin is so driven by your muscle and liver glycogen content that sort of determines what you're, I suspect, I should, perhaps shouldn't say it as, as dogmatically, but it seems to me that your insulin, average insulin is going to be a measure of how much glucose you have stored in the liver and, and the muscles. And if that is low, if you've got low muscle and liver glycogen content, then your insulin is going to be low and you're going to be burning fat. And, and the point is the muscles will burn the carbohydrate because why? because they're not stupid. <laughs> they know, <laughs> the muscles know that if you're eating a high carbohydrate diet, they can get rid of it, must get rid of the carbohydrate because there's another carbohydrate load coming, which is going to try and kill you in an hour or two's time. So you better get rid of all that muscle and liver glycogen so you can store it. So my opinion is simply that you store muscle and liver glycogen to get rid of the carbohydrate, to get it out of the system, to get it out of the blood uh, and into the tissues. Yeah, and so, and, sorry, sorry, carry no, on. I was just saying, the, the other thing that is sort of foundational to this understanding is that ketones are are produced by the liver and they're water soluble, so they are a fuel source that can do the things that glucose does, even when there isn't glucose present, even even in the stores and the the liver and muscle glycogen stores. The ketones can do all those things because they're water soluble. They can cross the blood brain barrier. They can nourish the, and energize the brain. All those things that sugar, you know, people think, ah, no sugar, you know, but, um, but the ketones do all that. And that's, that's this elegant system that was evolutionarily put right into us. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and for anyone who's interested in going more into the, this whole glycogen and blood glucose um, story that Prof Noakes is talking about. He really does a very eloquent, beautiful job of it in um, the exercise chapter of this textbook, where you can really read about what's actually going on with regards to um, fueling the brain and storing glucose, running on on running on blood glucose, um, and all the kind of related things. And yes, it's related to exercise, but it's a it's a greater understanding I think that everyone needs anyway whether it's to do with exercise or not we've got one more question and then we're going to wrap up because it is already time um could any of you answer Trisha's question about uh what about she says what about fasting and immunotherapy and mm -hmm. she says k truda or key truda to be exact I'm not sure what that is but it looks like Nasha knows mm -hmm. so Nasha shoot well, I'm cracking up because just uh, last well, last month or February, there was a study that came out showing that um, fasting is going to damage the immune system, despite literally decades of research suggesting otherwise. And they, the way they made their uh, assertion is that they said, 
Well, it's because when we test the blood of these mice in a fasted state, their monocytes are lower than those mice not in a fasted state. And I read a little bit deeper because what I've learned in positive studies of fasting on the immune system is that that's exactly what you want. You want those monocytes to go into the bone marrow. They're getting, they're, they're also like supercharging the T cells. It's like getting everything ready to pounce. And then once you're back into a fed state again, they will be released into the bloodstream. And so they, you know, they're, they're, they're giving these sort of crazy, um, headlines to in they're not, they're making the wrong conclusions. Let's put it that way. So specifically when you're using a drug, like a checkpoint inhibitor, such as Keytruda, you are invoking a massive cytokine an inflammatory process. That's its job. And yet in over 80% of the patients, they will have a very bad reaction, very bad side effect. It could even explode the cancer in some situations, but, or just flat out kill the patient or put them into distress in their GI tracts or thyroid, their kidney, their liver, et cetera. And so the power of being able to go into this fasted state in the midst of those treatments is it's like putting some of those um, uh, um, inflammatory or um, pro-inflammatory monocytes, which their job is to be inflama inflammatory to clean up the environment, puts them into the bone marrow so that the drug can come in and do its job and kind of kick things up. And then they come up and are the cleanup factory after so that it helps lower the cytokine release. It helps lower the tumor lysis process. And my patients who have bad reactions to, to these medications like Keytruda, the only strategy that I've seen effective to stop the crisis is fasting. And so it's interesting standard of care will give them steroids when they have these reactions. And yet that will just spur the insulin issue we just talked about and make everything worse. So it is one of the most powerful ways I think that this should be standard of care is fasting with our immune therapies. Brilliant, that was a great question, a great answer. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna wrap up now. Is there anything that the three of you feel is outstanding that you wanna add before we say goodbye? I don't want to leave leave things unwrapped up if you feel we've done everything because i think we've covered most of the ground um is there anything you want to add or can i just i'll just make an obvious point that the problem with insulin is that it's elevated in most of us because we continue eating carbohydrates and you have to get the insulin down it's almost like you go over the cliff and you've got to get the carb down 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 and once you go over the cliff then all these benefits start to be realized but many people don't understand that. They don't understand. So they don't quite get over the cliff and they don't get the benefits. Mm -hmm. So the, the point is you really have to work hard. You have to cut your carbs a long way to get the benefits of, of, of and fasting is one of the best ways of doing it because you're not counting calories. You're not counting carbs. You're just getting rid of all of them. So, so that's often why fasting is so effective. Great. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, that's, and that's so elegant because I just think that, you know, the simplest, the simplest way I think about it is our cancer cells are very flexible. They will kind of scavenge and be resourceful for anything. So, and our healthy cells, as we get sicker, they lose their flexibility. So the thing that happens with ketone bodies and with fasting is it increases the resilience and flexibility of our healthy cells and diminishes that flexibility of the cancer cells. So I just love this sort of double-edged sword that's playing in our favor when we bring these tools on board. And then the only other point I would make is that fasting, cheapest, easiest, like this is a therapy that leaves no one. Talk about equity, equality, talk about something that everyone has access to and can resource. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why this is not just a ubiquitous part of our medical healthcare system. Yeah. Can I ask Nasha one question? A lot of people in this country, because when they don't want the standard of care, they go over to other countries and they do all sorts of funny things and get lots of different supplements. Is there any evidence that that is going to work better than the proposals that you, the pro protocols that you're suggesting, or is it sub, could it be supplementary as well? I think that there's a place where the two can meet beautifully together, standard of care with alternative care, but needs to be based on an N of one. So we don't want to guess. People ju often jump in and try everything. And it's like, maybe the everything wasn't needed. Maybe it was more simple, or maybe it needed to be more complex, but that would be the N of one for each person. And I hope that the research and the things we're moving into will start to show 
this, you know, like again, beyond the anecdotes of which we have thousands, um, but to start to actually give us uh, publishable data on the best of both worlds. Great question. And one, one more thing I'd want to add is that fasting terrifies a lot of people. Um, it does not need to be water only fasting to be very effective. There are ways to support yourself whether that's using calorie-free beverages that are comfort to you, um, you know, a small amount of bone broth, electrolyte support, those sort of things. So that fasting doesn't have to be water only. And, and I mean, people are terrified, like they can't skip breakfast, never mind, you know, <laughs> 72 hours of fasting. So there, there needs to be some, some as, as Nisha says, N, N equals one, everybody is different in how they can approach it and, you know, and how to be supported. Um, so yeah, not, not to let it terrify you. And people say ketogenic diets are hard and, you know, they don't have to be hard either. Like there's, there's so much support. And, and I really think that that's where, <clears throat> excuse me, dietitians, um, we we're we're the implementers. Um, you know, we, we don't deal with the drugs. We, we, we're the ones that deal with that, <clears throat> excuse me, connection between food and people. Right. Mm -hmm and and society and culture and emotion and religion and all those various things that impact on how people eat um they all have to be taken into account and and there is a way to do it and it doesn't need to be terrifying yes thank you martha that's that's really so true and i think this chapter deals with that all really really well mm -hmm. and i just want to say one last thing which is that when it comes to cancer and maybe neurology I think those are the two areas where therapeutic carbohydrate restriction isn't so simple. If you are trying, to, if you're dealing with um, therapeutic curative kind of aims, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're just trying to lose some weight or you're trying to drop your insulin somewhat, or, um, you know, even, even cure diabetes, if you will, or, or put it into remission or whatever you'd like to say, that I feel is relatively simple. You go on a keto diet. In fact, you can even go on a low carb diet that's, I don't know, in our study, um, which I did in my master's a few years ago, we had an average of 64 grams of carbs being eaten. And in, in these people who had, who had reversed or put their type two diabetes into remission, that's not ketogenic level, you know, so it's quite chilled, if you will, the implementation of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction or keto low carb diets for these other applications. But as soon as it comes to cancer treatment or let's say Alzheimer's treatment, I think those are the two key ones that I just like to say, it's not straightforward and easy. Yes, you will you will reap benefits with just going keto and fasting and, or intermittent fasting or three day fast, whatever. Yes, you will reap benefits. But if you're trying to cure something, there are additional things that need to be taken into account. And that's where, you know, doctors such as Dr. Winters or registered dietitians such as Martha Tettenborn really know what they're doing and are so important because getting um, the glucose ket ketone index or ratio of the blood um, in line is important. So you're really needing to play with these strategies to push the ketones up pull the gl glucose down and then intermittently potentially play with glutamine and how much is being available to your cells. You're looking at adding additional things um, potentially um, and looking at things in a holistic way. And it becomes, if you're trying to treat cancer, um, it can, and you're wanting to do it as effectively as possible, as quickly as possible, then it does really require a knowledgeable healthcare professional. Um, Having said that, I think that a ketogenic diet and fasting in general will help. Um, but I just wanted to put that out there. This is really, this chapter is so important because it lays out all those details for clinicians so that they can be very informed um, and help their patients in a knowledgeable way that goes beyond just let's restrict carbs and put you on a bit of fasting. Um, because I think that will be good, but may not suffice when it comes to cancer treatment. So I just wanted to add that and please, please read, read this chapter. It's exceptionally good. And thank you so much to all of you authors um, for being here and for letting us know a little bit about what's going on in this chapter and what people can expect. Um, it's very exciting. I know that everyone will love reading your sections. So thank you so much and have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening or night, wherever you are around the globe. And we look forward to taking you through chapter seven next time.
Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.